Hi, welcome. My name is Rabbi Baruch Fogel. I am the campus rabbi here at the Torah Law School. Welcome to the third in a series of lectures on Judaism. Today's lecture will be on the why and what of kosher, what makes something kosher, and what is the reason why that we keep kosher. The first I'd like to talk about, um, the first half is like what is, what, the what of kosher, what is kosher. Uh, a lot of people are confused, so just a, a quick overview of what is kosher, even though he, you know, technically you can speak for hours and hours about every little minutia or many details, but I'm going to do a general overview of what is kosher. The first thing, uh, what is kosher, is that there are certain things in the world that were designated as being kosher. So firstly, all vegetation is kosher. It means all, uh, any, any plant life or anything like that is kosher, That's it, right? And then now we come to the living creatures. So if you're a vegetarian, and, you don't, and you're really vegetarian, you're good. Then you can keep it kosher. Except, we'll see in a second, that it's, in today's day and age, it's not so simple. So the first thing is, in Leviticus, in chapter 11, um, the Bible lists a few of the as, um, it breaks the categories animals, birds, fowl, and fish, and insects. So of those four categories, there are some that are kosher and some that are not kosher. Of animals, any animal which chews its cud, which means that it has a four-part stomach, which means that it eats its food and then regurgitates it and it breaks it down again, and has split hooves, has, that it's, has feet that it's uh, split in, totally split in half, that is called a kosher animal. Um, for example, there are the two famous examples which have one but not the other are the camel and the pig. The camel uh, chews its cud but does not have split hooves, and a pig has split hooves but does not chew its cud. This is a pig over there. No, the pig, always, the pig has split hooves. That's why the pig always sticks. It does have split hooves. It does have split hooves. You said the other one. Did? Okay, yeah. Yeah, you said it chews its cud. The, a pig splits, has split hooves and does not chew its cud, and a camel chews its cud but does not have split hooves. So those are not kosher animals. What about llamas? Uh, no, like new world animals that weren't around. Right, that's a great question. But again, um, te uh, technically, uh, if, you, if you see it as a four parts ruminating stomach and it has fully split hooves, it would be 100% kosher. Um, right. Yeah. Again, that is, you're already bringing in, like, um, that was a question brought up many years ago. Both, well, we'll talk about this week is Thanksgiving. Well, again, when we get to get to birds, I'll answer the question a little bit. Okay, so, um, so very simple. An animal, that's an kosher animal. Secondly is fowl. The Torah, the Bible, does not list what the characteristics of a kosher bird is. The Torah just lists many birds that are not kosher. So in theory, if you would know the Hebrew of the Bible and you would know which species it's referring to, any species not referred to as non-kosher would be kosher. The problem is we don't know which species, exact species in the Hebrew language of the of 3,000 years ago, what exactly it's referring to. So the tradition is that any that we only eat uh, birds that are not um, that are not kosher, no, but that, that are uh, that are birds of prey, that birds that have, uh, attack other birds that are that are very vicious. Especially, we, so we have we have many different um, characteristics. Depends where the claws are, the way they fly, the way they sit. But at the end of the day, for hundreds of years, almost thousands of years, we only eat birds or fowl that we have a tradition on. So we have a tradition that this was kosher because our fathers and our grandfathers and our mothers and our grandmothers told us so. The main problem with that is Thanksgiving. Because when we discovered America, we discovered a wonderful new species of bird called turkey, which no one had ever seen before because they're indigenous to North America. For like the American buffalo, which really is a bison, same concept. I mean, you have an animal that you've no one's, no one's ever seen before because no one's been to America. So what do you do from a Torah, from a Jewish standpoint of about an animal that you don't have a tradition on? And that is why, again, technically or not, it, it might be kosher, might not be kosher, but we might not know. So there are people who don't eat buffalo and turkey, and there are people who say it is, uh, the turkey is not a, uh, or a angry bird, it's a very nice bird, <laughs> and therefore we can eat turkey. So that is why Jews can't partake in Thanksgiving, because we can have turkey. Now, but of both animals and, uh, and fowl and birds, even though it's kosher, it has to be slaughtered properly. 
That means even though technically it's a kosher animal, because we are afraid of, not, not getting to reasons, we, we, um, we'll talk about reasons later, to, the only way to eat a kosher, to make an animal which is kosher edible, is if it is slaughtered properly. Take a very sharp knife, cut it by its neck in a very specific way, where you totally sever the arteries and the veins leading to the red, so there's an instantaneous drop of blood pressure to the brain, so that there is no, so which removes all feeling for the animal, so the animal doesn't feel anything. It's, it's the, in our opinion, the most humane way to slaughter an animal, and only then is a kosher animal allowed to be eaten. So again, you could have, and technically, you could have cow, which is a kosher animal, but if it's not killed in the proper way, it is unkosher to eat. Point number two is that blood of an animal is considered unkosher. The actual blood of the animal, you know the animal's kosher, the blood is unkosher. To even, so again, you have, you have a cow, and you slaughtered it properly, but if you didn't remove the blood in the proper way, it's also not kosher. So you have the same cow can be not kosher for two reasons. One is you didn't slaughter it properly, and two, you didn't remove its blood properly. And that is, well, that's why, for those who buy kosher meat, you'll notice that all kosher meat is slightly saltier than non-kosher meat. The way we drain the blood is that we sprinkle very kosher salt. Anyone want to know why it's called kosher salt? Have you ever watched yeah. the cooking shows? Yeah. It's called kosher salt. Mm -hmm. Why it's actually, it's, it's not the right term. All salt is kosher. Salt is sodium chloride. It is a mineral. You can't get a mineral to be not kosher. It's actually a mispronunciation of the original word. It was too kosher salt or kosher salt. It was it's thick, it's, it's heavy pieces of salt which used to spread on the meat to draw out the blood. So it has nothing, it is not co more kosher, less kosher. Kosher salt has nothing to do with kosher. It has too kosher, too kosherized meat you take this salt and you spread it on it. So it, it's creep, it has crept into the um, Food Channel Network, but um, it has nothing to do with being more kosher than less kosher. So let's say uh, we take the, the, the meat from, let's say, a cow. Right, slaughtered properly. Right, then they, they like dip it in salt? And then they, they, cover, they cover all the salt, let the salt draw out the blood, oh, and then wow. you rinse off a number of hours. And then you let, and then you let, and then you rinse it off well. And it has to. And not only that, if you would do it in a pan where the blood would just stay there, it'd be no good. You have to let it perforate it or hang, and then you wash it off. Right. Yes, that is so. In, in yeah, that is what all the factors are doing. So there's a lot of stages to get the same cow prepared uh, to be kosher. In the old days. You know, in the Lower East Side in 1910, you bought the chicken home. You went to your neighborhood's, you know, the guy who slaughtered with his knife, and then you, every housewife knew how to do this. She had, the, every housewife had a special a place in her kitchen where she had a perforated board, she had kosher salt, and she would salt all inside and outside, drain the blood, and that's how they needed it. Right? So we, we, uh, housewives and, and husbands today are very thankful to the modern kosher industry that we don't no longer have to do this. Okay, fish. So fish does not need slaughtering, but only the only species of fish that are kosher are um, that have fins and scales. Fins to swim with, scales to breathe with. Even a few scales, like a tuna, has very little scales on it, but it has some scales, it is kosher. All mammals of the water are not kosher, dolphin and the like. Um, and all shellfish are not kosher because they don't have, they live in the water and they don't have fins and scales. So that is why uh, Jew will not eat uh, lobster or Yes. What about uh, like sharks or predatory fish? Right. Those, if they would, in theory, if they would have, they don't. All, all predatory fish, are, in front of their mammals, right? And if they're eating up their fish, they don't have fins and scales. Oh. Okay. So then they're not kosher. That's that, that in fish is not a question of predatory or not. Oh, okay. It's a question of the fins and the scales. But they have fins. Don't they have sharks? If they don't scales. Do. If they don't scales. scales. They don't scales. Yeah. So um, yes, sharks. Are, uh, that is why. Um, that is why um, you know tuna, yeah, for sure, is a, a kosher. Uh, is a kosher fish. It's not a question of if there's some dolphin mixed into your tuna. So that's why we're very happy when there's dolphin-free tuna. To um, when that whole thing happened, you know, in the world, so it made our tuna. You know, I have a question. Uh, so if there, like, I, I know you said before, there's like with the turkey, there's areas where where you may not know for sure if it's kosher or not kosher. Is there like a rule that if you don't know for sure, you should just avoid it? That is a debate amongst rabbis. It's a great question. Okay. That is a debate amongst rabbis. That is why till today there are some people who don't eat turkey. Okay. And there are some people who won't eat water buffalo or, or bison. 
because we don't have a tradition. Other rabbis say, hey, listen, we have the rules set down in the, in the Bible and we're okay. But I guess if you do eat it and you know it is actually uh, not kosher, would, would, would uh, I guess, ignorance of that be like an excuse? That, that's, that, that, that's a whole other okay. lecture. That's a great question. That's a whole other <laughs> okay, question. Okay. Now the fourth type of living creature which is permitted and forbidden are insects. Almost all insects are forbidden. Any creepy crawly, almost. any bugs, almost all. There are some species of grasshoppers and crickets which are permitted. What? Now, we have, most Jewish communities have lost the tradition of how to tell. It's got to have the wings in the right place. But there are some places that have a tradition and they eat grasshoppers. I personally can't imagine eating a grasshopper, but that's because of cultural. That's not because of, um, that has nothing to do with kosher. There are in, now there are two wonderful rabbis and doctors who live, uh, I think, in Israel, who make it their mission to take all the kosher food that no one's eaten and eat them again. So, and they eat these grasshoppers. I uh, all the power to them. The reason I mention that is that none of us are really going on purpose and eating uh, insects. But as all good restaurants and people know, that a salad can be a wonderful source of protein. There are a lot of bugs in salad. There are a lot of bugs. That I, I don't want to ruin anyone's day, but um, if you take a, go to any any uh, supermarket, take buy a head of romaine, and check it, you will see a lot of little bugs. A lot of bugs in salad. We um, or the food is not eat those bugs. So we uh, there's certain vegetables that people don't eat, like broccoli or cauliflower, which have notoriously are, are bug infested. Now, um, in the period of the 1940s, when there's something called DDT, which was sprayed everywhere and killed, which is a natural pesticide, which is a great pesticide, it's not good for humans, but it's a great, not good for bugs either for that matter. So <laughs> that, um, that pesticide made it, you could eat any, any vegetable, because there were no more bugs and vegetables. But nowadays, when DDT is now forbidden, most, um, most leafy vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, artichoke, all of the like have a lot of little bugs. Strawberries, raspberries, blackberries, they have little, little bugs. If you're bored, I can show you the videos of them. You can, if, you, if you just take a good camera and just watch the strawberry for long enough, you'll see from seed to seed little bugs going. Okay, so now, if you're not grossed out by it, or if you don't look, everything's great. What's the problem? But if you're trying to keep kosher, so that is why, if you'll notice, if you ever ask Dahlia, if you go into the kitchen, she checks every lettuce leaf. Here in, in the, she has a light box, or hold it up to light, but she has a light box. She takes every leaf of romaine lettuce, looks at it, the leaf is translucent, bugs aren't, and then they take all the bugs off. So that is the basic um, what of kosher. Except that is what is kosher. There's another stage, and that is the uh, Bible forbade eating milk and meat together. Milk is kosher, comes from a kosher animal. Um, again, milk, well, that's I'll go back. Milk, which comes from a not kosher animal, is not kosher. So if you go to Be'er Shava in Israel, or uh, the Bedouin encampments in the south of Israel, you can buy camel's milk. I'm told that it makes delicious ice cream. I don't know. But they say that the fat, the fat content, the way it is, it, it's delicious. Because a camel is a non-kosher animal, therefore the milk which comes out of the, out of the camel is not kosher. I'll just give you a little bit, let's, so that you could ask the question, this is a the question that has been raised by the Talmud 2,000 years ago, a bee is an insect and is not kosher. So why is honey kosher? Honey, in theory, comes from a bee. A bee is a not kosher animal. So just like camel milk is not kosher, so too honey should be not kosher. It's a good question. So the rabbis of the Talmud said, there are two opinions, the majority opinion is because it's actually the bee doesn't make the honey, it just takes the nectar from the flower and you know, puts it in the hive, and it is, it's just a transporter, but it itself is not really adding anything to the honey. A modern day, just to make this like a little bit advanced, a modern day question which arose is that almost all uh, the candy we eat, you know, Mike and Ike's, let's give you Mike and Ike's, Mike and Ike's, Mike and Ike's, Mike and Ike's right? Mike and Ike's have glaze on it to make it have a shiny uh, substance, to make it look shiny and nice and keep it hard until you eat it. It's called confectionery glaze. It's actually called shellac and it comes from a beetle. A beetle uh, leaves shellac behind after it eats on uh, the tree. So now, is that shellac kosher? Because again, it passed through the beetle 
So, or if he, you know, he ate a plate, plant, it comes from an Indian word uh, for beetle, shellac, I think, not exactly. The bottom line is, is it like honey or is it like camel's milk? And this is debated. Many, many uh, authorities in America permit it, but in Israel you won't find Mike and Ikes because they don't permit the shellac from the beetle. Because again, it came from a non-kosher animal. Uh, um, so, the most prevalent um, problem of kosher is even when you have kosher meat and kosher milk, you may not have meat and milk together. The Torah, the Bible, repeats this three times, three separate places. Do not cook a kid in its mother's milk. You repeat the same verse three times. It's actually to teach us that you're not only not allowed to eat it, you're not allowed to cook them together without planning to eat it. So if you had a, if you're an Orthodox Jew and had plans of being on top chef, you should change your plans. Because you can go on top chef and cook pork all you want. You can't eat it, you can cook it. You can go ahead and cook lobster all you want. You can't eat it, you can cook it. But milk and meat together, not only can you not eat, you can't even cook, even if you're not planning on eating it. You're not even cook them together. Now, because of the seriousness that we, that we not only forbid you, uh, the Torah, the Bible forbids eating, it also forbids cooking together. It said not only actual milk and meat that you see in front of you cooking, but any pot that has absorbed um, and from the milk or from the meat has the status of milk or meat. So a pot which I cook milk in, I may not cook meat in, and vice versa. A pot, which, a pot which I cook meat in, I may not cook milk in. So this is the most uh, obvious uh, part of kosher, is that uh, a kosher home will have two sets of everything. Two sets of forks and knives and pans and pots and plates and everything because we absolutely do not want to milk, mix milk and meat. We don't want to cook them together, we don't want them touching. And then it goes even a step further, and that we don't even mix milk and meat at the same meal. So that, so that if I'm going to have a chicken lunch, I can't have a glass of milk not only at the same meal, I um, will wait six hours from the last time I put a piece of meat or chicken in my mouth, Till I have anything milky, till I have Hershey bar, till I have a coffee. Um, the, the, the reverse is not true. That means if after you have milk, uh, coffee, Hershey bar, you can have meat. Some people wait a half hour, except, and this is an exception, except hard cheeses. That means if you eat Parmesan, like Arena Romano, or they have a very, uh, very, there's a very good kosher cheese company called The Cheese Company, which you just have from Sawmill Parkway uh, in upstate New York. It has a, new, a very 24-month uh, cheese, which is aged. This is, we live, uh, I'll talk for myself a little bit, we live in an age where the kosher food industry is booming. Most food you can make kosher. I mean, you can't make bacon. Well, they have fake, Actually, they have fake it, as they call it, which is fake bacon. You can't make real bacon kosher. It's my pig, it's nothing to do about it. But we today are living in an age where the kosher consumer is expanding. The kosher industry is a few billion dollars. Most of the kosher industry is not Jews. We're not kosher giving Jews. It's, it's the, the world at large has decided, thank God, that the kosher is a good thing, and it really is. We'll talk about that in a second. And therefore, the kosher industry is booming. So therefore, you can get a lot, a lot of foods. So there's one, so remember when, you know, 20 years ago, there was no kosher parmesan. Today, thank God, there is kosher Parmesan, there's kosher Pecorino Romano, there's kosher almost anything. It's kosher bacon. You can go to the store and buy fake bacon. You'll still yeah. I have a question, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if this has been discussed uh, by rabbis, uh, but now I guess with the advances of technology, uh, genetic modifications, let's say if you were to be able to, to genetically modify a pig to have, you know, one <coughs> pig, not split hooves. And, well, it has the hooves already, so I guess to modify to have a okay. ruminating stomach would be a little different. But let, let's go back. Can you genetically modify a camel? Okay, but it's, right. You know, it just modified genetically, so it doesn't have the characteristics of a non kosher It's a good question. <laughs> that, that, is, that is a good question. Um, it, it's related to the question of, of what's a species and what's okay. not. And it's, it's, it's part of the question of, like, can you eat the water buffalo or, or things like that? That, on one hand, what you see in front of you is good, but on the other hand, you know that it's not, and things like that. Or you don't know if it's not, so. Um, I, I think the better question would be that, that, um, or get, that uh, you know, the hamburger they just made? They were, uh, it was in the news. They, they grew a hamburger in a petri dish. 
It means to oh, they, yeah, these, yeah, I don't know if you read this. So they, I, 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 they, I, I, they, I, I, they took, they, they, it's, uh, it's a totally, um, totally um, laboratory processed meat. I mean, it's totally, it's not from an animal. They took cells, they, uh, they had it grow, it's, you know, cells into a hamburger. And they just fed it to a few gastronomes to see if it actually tasted good. So would that be kosher? But it's totally created from nothing, it's just cells. That would be an, an interesting question. That is a totally different topic of when things get microscopic and when things get um, to the cellular level, do they lose its identity? In other words, just because I know this cell comes from a certain place, does it lose its identity? That is a, 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 total, a hotly debated topic to this day. Um, there is no consensus. We, we, had that, we had that problem. I'll give you, for example, one of, the, one of the big issues is marshmallows. One of the big kosher issues is like, you know, I've never had Lucky Charms. Always wanted to have Lucky Charm cereal. Never had Lucky Charm cereal because Lucky Charm cereal has marshmallows in it. And what's wrong with marshmallows? Well, as you know, um, all good marshmallows come from pigs. If you didn't know that, now you know. Because what happens is for the for the structure of, of the gelatin, you need collagen. You need a, a structure, a lattice work, which holds all the material in it. The best lattice comes from bones of animals. So you take pig bones boil them down, you get all the stuff off, you acidify it, and until you get that chemical structure called collagen, which makes wonderful marshmallows. So every time you have Lucky Charms, are you eating pig? Right? What? Yes. Well, the reason many Orthodox Jews do not eat Lucky Charms is because it has marshmallows, which is made from pig bones, so, we, so it's like you're eating pig. Now, you can argue, and there are rabbis who do, say, no, 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 no. This is collagen. This is a cell. This is a, it's a uh, chemical composition which happened to be found in pigs. But you boil down that bone till it, till its chemical composition. It's no longer pig. It's chemicals. The same way I can make those chemicals in a lab, I happen to have gotten them from a pig. So there are some people who would eat gelatin and things like that. And there are some people who don't. Yeah. I was going to say not that I've read the ingredients off. I don't eat Lucky Charms, but oh, the marshmallows and Lucky Charms. Are nothing like natural marshmallow. I really have to wonder if they even have some of the same composition. Oh, I mean, marshmallow we, would have. Well, I, 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 I just dehydrated. But it's, yeah. the same, it's a marshmallow. It is, it is a marshmallow. I, I've never had Lucky Charm, but I tell you this much: almost all cereals are kosher, and of course, and Lucky Charm does not. So that, that's my way of knowing that it's that it, it has that it has that. Um, Can we go back? Yeah. So after you have a hard cheese, you have a salad. Six hours, like like they meat. Yes. Uh, the only thing is that if it's melted hard cheese, people are, are, are leaning to consider that regular. So that means if you melt your Parmesan, or you put it into a very hot, you know, if, you, if you shave some Parmesan on top of a pasta and it melts, then you don't have to wait six hours. Oh. Regular, like whatever you have to melt. Whatever. Yeah? Why the difference between salt and hard cheese? Um, it, it, it goes back to the question, which no one asked. Why do we wait after meat and we don't wait after milk? So the, the, that answer is good. There's a, either the taste lingers in your mouth or the taste lingers in your stomach. So hard cheeses are, are considered more meat-like and soft cheeses and milk are not. Well, it's the digestion. It's either digestion or your teeth, either way. Okay, so now that's, that's the basic what of kosher. There's obviously lots and lots of um, minutia. And again, most of the times rabbis get questions of kosher. It's not if something or it's not something kosher. It's people who by mistake um, put a meat spoon in a, in a milk pot. Or by mistake I cooked my, um, I, I cooked, you know, in the old days, you know, I cooked my, I fried my onions in schmaltz, which is chicken fat, in, you know, <coughs> the wrong thing. So those, when Rabbi dealt with kosher, he always dealt with usually the milk and meat. That is um, the most common and the most obvious kosher issue that, uh, that people face. And that is why, um, like in the kitchen here, there are separate, totally, totally separate kitchens. Everything is totally separate because we don't want any mixing of milk and meat. So that is the what of kosher. I'm just going to continue to the why of kosher. That's okay. Why do we keep kosher? So it, the question of why we do um, commandments that are given in the Bible is it's not a new question that we're asking today. This is a question that was asked, you know, centuries and, and decades, millennia ago. There are always two aspects of the question. So what Question one is, what benefit do I get? In other words, I who have been commanded, I who want to follow these commandments, what benefit is it to me in keeping kosher? And another question is, why did 
God who commanded it, what, what was his reason? Now, it, they don't have to go together. In other words, I could find a benefit in keeping kosher, which might not be why he commanded it, but it's still a good idea. But however, then, then the question is, that's already, is that a man-made law or is it a man-made idea or is it what God had in mind? And the same thing reversed. You can say that, okay, God commanded something. I might not see a benefit for myself, but he commanded it. And he, he obviously knows what's going on. So this was a debate amongst the, Ar in, in the Arab scholars in the 8th and 9th and 10th centuries. They debated if there was uh, Muatatzalites and Ashir uh, Ashariites. The word Sharia. Ashariites and Muatatzalites debated this, whether or not um, we, can, we can give a reason to God's laws. Okay? So the truth is we, we look, we uh, Judaism try to find a little bit of both. On one hand, we definitely, at the end of the day, sometimes say we don't know. We don't know why God commanded this, but we do it because we know He commanded it. It's good for us. But on the other hand, we always try to endeavor to explain it both on the level of what do you have in mind, and B, what do we benefit from it. So I think the second, what we benefit from it, um, keep it kosher, I think is pretty obvious. Um, I just as a father of children, you know, you see it very clearly. You know, when you go to the checkout aisle and the People who run supermarkets want you to buy candy, so they put the, like when you're waiting in line, that's where they put the candy, and that's where all the kids will get. Say, <laughs> can I have a chocolate bar? Can I please have this? So it's very hard to say no. We all, we, no one likes to say no to the kids, but it's it's funny that when you say it's not kosher, when it, when it's not kosher, not lying, hopefully, when you say it's not kosher to your children, it's automatic. Oh, okay. And it's unbelievable the sense of self-discipline that you know we've we've been. Um, personal, you know, we uh, London, and there was almost no kosher food to be found. And then my kids were starting, but they didn't even like say, they didn't even have a question mark, can we eat something? Well, until we find kosher food, we're just going to have to wait. So the question of self-discipline, of holding back, and of being able to say um, no, is a wonderful uh, trait for humans to acquire. Um, instead of saying, why not always, is always, you know, like, why not? Might as well. So the, the question is always, no, can I, and is it permitted? And that uh, self-restraint is really one of the hallmarks of, of, according to Judaism, of a hallmark of a human being. The concept that an intellect can rule over one's instincts is what we you know, hope for a human to achieve, that always his intellect is, is uh, what is right, is better than what he wants, you know, than the here and now. And that is the concept of kosher, that we're always thinking before we do something, and we're always judging is this the right thing, irrelevant of why it is, but then that that we've trained ourselves to always live that way um, is a wonderful thing. As an aside, even though it's not a question of kosher, but it's uh, related to eating food, is that um, Orthodox Jews also, um, and many others, uh, say a blessing before they eat and a blessing after they eat. They recognize that, they recognize before they eat that God gave us the food, that God created us, created the food, and afterwards they're thankful for the food. So that means the eating process, which can um, quickly slide into a total instinctive and total uh, uh, animalistic uh, expression of eating, eat, uh, of, of humanness, has always uh, kept in checks and balances by, um, by, one's, by one's instinct, by one, sorry, one's intellect. Always think, thinking before you eat, and thinking after you eat, and also making sure it's kosher that when you control your instincts by your intellect, that is the most human um, endeavor that we can have in, in, a, in an area where eating can take over. And you'll see people, um, you know, go to the to the continue eating like Americans can eat. Um, but that only that only works in a way that you can control yourself, or that your intellect, all of your instinct. When there's your hopefully you know, your intellect will um, have something to grab onto. You know, your kids. So then your kids listen to your parents. So they say whatever. They said it's not kosher. They don't need it. But now that we're all adults, and now we, it's not just okay. I'm going to control myself uh, just cause. You know, we have to have a reason to control ourselves, not just because it's a good idea to be you know um, good you know perfect humans or able to control themselves. Even though it is a good idea, but it, that's not enough. So the question really goes back to so why. Can we understand in our limited understanding what God had in mind by you know commanding um, things are kosher, how to eat, and all those things? Again, with the assumption that sometimes we'll have to come to the point of I don't know, and because He said so, right? There are points, and then you get to the point, and that's that's where people's faith are tested. 
that once in a while, like, you know, I don't understand, and I, I'm going to trust that because he commanded, I, I will listen. But nevertheless, we, we try as hard as we can to understand because we understand, we hope and we believe that there is some reason that we can grasp onto and, and hold onto that will be that are meaningful for us. So I think in my opinion, that this, this, he, everything till now has been sort of obvious and, and, and factual. Um, the, the one and only commandment Adam and Eve were given in the Garden of Eden was not to eat something. Everyone knows, right? Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. God gave one commandment. Don't eat from that tree. And they failed. But the question is, why? If you're going to give one commandment, imagine you're God, you're speaking to you, you created Adam and Eve, and you're speaking to them, uh, believe in me, you know, do a good deed, you know, give them something you know, more spiritual than don't eat that. Like, why is that, that, the commandment, the original question? The original sin was only a question of that, now, the eating and not eating. It's a, little, it's a little funny. So the rabbis have explained that the question of eating is much more than just uh, satiating my desires or, or, or continuing, you know, uh, just you know, enjoying myself or you know, feeling full. It's that we constantly are growing. We are constantly changing and growing. Human beings, that we need to eat. We wouldn't eat, we'd starve. We, our bodies would stop to function. The way a human being um, continues and continues to grow, even after being created, is always through by taking something from this world and making that part of you. And that's how you continue on in this world. So in fact, when God was, I created a world. God created a world, they said, okay, now, not only did I create a world, I actually gave two commandments to Adam and Eve. One was don't eat from the tree. And the other one is to have children. Well, how are those related? Because they're both about growth and, and creating more. A, creating more children, and also creating more of yourself. Because if you wouldn't eat, your, your energy would take away all your, you know, your fat and your protein and your muscles and eat away your body. Because you always have to bring in nourishment so that you can continue and you can continue as human as who you are. So what God really said to Adam and Eve was, I created you. But I want you now to create yourselves, create future human beings, and create yourselves anew. Every time that you go ahead and eat something, you are continuing that process of creating. You are continuing that process of making yourselves. Because if it wouldn't be eating, you would yourselves would stop and cease to exist. And you, so now I am telling you, the, because of God, I am telling you the proper way to create yourselves. The creator of the world is telling us this is the proper way, this is the, the, the ingredients that is meant, that is needed for us to continue to create ourselves. So, do we understand the laws of kosher? We understand the, the, all the different things. We can go into the details of these are the things which the one who created understands is the right way for us to continue to create ourselves and the wrong things that are continued to create ourselves. Those two things together are how we move forward um, in creation. So, for example, almost all the kosher, almost all the kosher animals we said before are not predatory, um, and even animals that are kosher, we don't eat the blood. We consider those all predatory animals, and the blood of every animal to have too much animalistic instincts. That if we were to imbibe them, if we were to make them part of ourselves, if that's what would cause us to grow and continue to be then we too would take, um, acquire those characteristics. Now, you know, for many years this was a, this was a hard sell. You know, th this is, uh, didn't uh, resonate with many people. Nowadays we understand, you know, the way my, you know, one microgram of, of a certain medicine or a certain drug, or, um, you know, natural foods which have, you know, one, a few parts per million of a certain thing, and that has an effect on the body. Today we understand this, it's a much easier to understand this concept of kosher. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, meat is meat. What's the difference if it comes from a cow or comes from a pig? But at the end of the day, uh, the, the one who created both the cow and the pig says, no, there, there, there's that slight thing in that pig which will have an effect on you. Now, we don't see the effect the same way, you know, we don't always see the effect of, uh, of cholesterol and uh, other things. So, in the spiritual sense, 
God was saying is that I know the makeup of these things, and when you take to make them as part of you, you will have they will become part of you. Now you can't measure it; it's not uh, LDL or HDL, but it is a it is a reality that when you take it and you ingest it, it will become part of you. And that is why the most important thing, which he told Adam, is be careful what you eat, because that will determine who you are. And I'm commanding you that you have to be the best person. You have to be the best type of person. You have to be the purest person possible. And therefore, all the laws of kosher are meant to keep that person in that pristine stage of, of the way he was created. Okay? That's the general overview of the reasons for kosher. Now we can go to the why the birds, why the insects, um, why we, you know, we slow we spoke for us a humane way. Um, and what else? And milk and meat is also, that's the, the one that's a little bit, um, a little bit Difficult because again, again they're kosher in and of itself. Right? The milk is kosher, the meat is kosher. It's that you're creating something which is not kosher by the milk and meat. The rabbis of the Talmud actually spoke about that. That it was a very, um, it's an interesting or uh, an interesting law where not only where you took something two perfectly acceptable things and you put them together and you made them not kosher. So one of it definitely has to do with um, the a merciful thing. Because the, the way the commandment is given is do not slaughter, a, you know, cook a kid, a baby deer in its mother's milk. So it's definitely always to keep us reminiscent that um, there was some aspect of mercy that if that, you know, that it's not proper to take a, you know, a child in its own mother's milk and you cook it together. Well, if you got the milk from somewhere. Right, so that's the combo yes. So if you had the milk from somewhere else, or you have two different species, you have, you know, cows, you know, cow's milk and sheep, right? They're not related to each other. I mean, sheep is a kosher animal. So what would the problem there be? So, and, um, so again, you could say, no, no, God said so, right? That's also a perfectly acceptable answer. But what we're trying to say is that sometimes um, man has the ability to create something which, which was not what God intended. Sometimes when you take the milk and the meat and you take the, the, so the representation of what milk represents, which is the giving of the life, you take the meat, which is representing you know, the end of life and you slaughter, and you put them together, both, it's not a good, it, God said it's not a good match, but also it c can create these, this idea that you created something which you took to, two things and you created something which wasn't meant to be. So for example, that's why um, there's something called shotnays, that we're not going to mix wool and linen together in our clothing. Sometimes there are each, we have proper compounds, but when you put them together, they become in a way destructive. So the concept of milk and meat is that. The milk represents the, the life-giving force that, a, that a, a cow has for its young, and the meat represents the end source of the, the life of an animal. The, you know, it's it's basic, it's base uh, characteristics. So you putting those two forces together creates some you know uh, opposition, which turns out to be not good. That's why you're not allowed. Eat, that's why you're not allowed to even cook it together, even if you have no intention to eating it. Just creating that compound is considered no good, because you created something which wasn't two things which weren't meant to be together. So it's not only because um, you, you're not allowed to eat it, you're not allowed to even cause it, that's what I said before, you can't even go on Top Chef and um, compete. Okay, if there's any questions. Yes. So you yeah. talked about how like, you, know, you are what you eat, and that's why you know, you're prohibited certain foods. So how about uh, like, uh, issues of like, um, I guess like alcohol, or drug use, or smoking, uh, tobacco is that is does kosher law cover those things too, or is it kosher law just cover? Um, well, kosher uh, only. Yes, yeah, so it's a great question. Kosher law only speaks about something you 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 ingest. Okay. Alcohol is definitely a question. There are kosher wines and not kosher wines. There are kosher gra there are almost all grains of kosher. So, but so almost all. Um, it's like beer. Almost all beers, unflavored beers, are kosher because it comes from hops and barley and the like. Um, wines can be questionable. And, and again, as stuff like flavorings are added to, um, to some beers and make it kosher. But uh, you're asking more in the, in the sense of you know, addiction or... or yeah. So there, there's another a specific verse in the Bible which says, you know, be very careful and how to treat your body. And, and the rabbis today have almost all forbidden smoking or just starting someone to smoke. Um, addiction, they're, they're very, you know, against addiction and therefore they basically forbid marijuana use and all things further. 
And alcohol, you'll find statements in the Talmud which with denigrating the alcohol use which could lead to drunkenness. On the other hand, the problem with that is we find many places where alcohol is praised. You'll have, we, we make the Kiddush on Friday night and all holidays on, on a cup of wine. So you, and on the Passover or the Seder, we drink four cups of wine. So you do find where wine is where those one thing where you can go, it has a positive and a negative. Um, but, um, so it's, but it's not a kosher issue, okay. except yeah. wine itself is a kosher issue. That's why if you ever want to buy a, there are very good kosher wines out there. They have 95s and 97s on the ratings, but um, there are a lot, most wines are not kosher. You can't find good kosher wine, but. Um, What's the difference with the kosher wine? What do they do? Um, wine started, uh, yeah. wine started, the whole other, the whole other okay. thing. In theory, all grapes are kosher okay. because um, the practice of idolatry for, for centuries was to pour wine at the altars mm. of, of their idols. Wine, any wine not made uh, in a Jewish factory, it, we, don't go, we don't drink, not because it is idolatry, it's because that was an instituted ban from, from when, idol, when wine was primarily used in, in idol worship. Okay, thank you all. Very good. Thank you.